Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran celebrates the birth of Al-Anbiya. This is in the Quran. Quran is Dalil Qat'i. So we have Dalail that are general and then more specific. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quoting Isa alayhi salam says, Wassalamu alayya yawma wuridtu. Peace be upon me the day that I was born. Peace be upon me the day that I was born. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about Yahya alayhi salam, Wassalamun alayhi yawma wulida. Peace be upon him the day that he was born. In Sahih Muslim, uh, the Prophet وسلم, was fasting on Monday. And the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, why are you fasting? His answer was, Yawma wuridtu fi. This is the day that I was born. And so what do you think the Sahaba did with that information? So, oh, that's nice. No, they started fasting on Monday because they emulate him. They have ittiba' of the Prophet ﷺ. Ittiba', you know, in Ayatul Imtihan, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ the love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for us is commensurate with the level of ittiba' we have for the Prophet sallallahu The Sahaba knew this, khayrun nas qarni, no one knows aqidah better than Sahaba. So they began to fast. Why? In celebration of the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But are there other ways to celebrate? Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would eulogize the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu in poetry. He used to say that the Prophet Sallallahu when the Prophet was an infant, he would lie in his cradle and the Prophet would point to the moon and play with the moon. And Abbas said, Wallahi, I would see the moon shaking in the sky based on what you were doing with your finger. Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam. There are numerous ahadith that are mentioned by great scholars, Qadi Iyad and Kitab al-Shifa you know, things in nature happening at his birth, animals conversing and greeting each other, the fire in Persia that was burning, that was revered by the Majus, by the Zoroastrians, was suddenly extinguished at his birth, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the balconies of, uh, of Kaisar, of Caesar, suddenly crumbled, this, the waters of the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee in Palestine, had receded, so things were happening. You know, in Sahih Bukhari, we were told that Al-Abbas, he had a dream of Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab, right? Abu Lahab, Abdul, his name was Abdul Ka'aba ibn Abdul Muttalib. He had a dream of Abu Lahab. And Abu Lahab was in a terrible state. Right? Tabbat yada Abi Lahab bin Watab. Right? May the hands of Abu Lahab perish. Abu Lahab used to follow the Prophet chase the Prophet and throw stones at the Prophet So he put hands on the Prophet Something you don't want to do. It's be, you fall in danger of su'al khatima. Uh, if you show enmity towards the beloved ones of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man adali waliyan faqad adhantahu bil harb. Whoever shows enmity towards my awliya, my friends, take notice of war from me. This is hadith Qudsi. So tabbat yada abi laha bin watab. So Abu Lahab, you know, he's speaking to Al-Abbas. This is in Bukhari. And Al-Abbas, he says, what is your state? And he says, terrible, terrible. But on Mondays, on Mondays, I can drink some cool water from my finger, my right index finger. I have a little bit of relief. And he said, why? Because on the day of the birth of the Prophet وسلم, Abu Lahab pointed to a slave of his, a slave girl, Fuwayba, the first wet nurse of the Prophet وسلم, and he said, Anti hurrali wajhillah, you are free for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he pointed to her with his finger. So here is a certified kafir. Abu Lahab is a kafir. There's no doubt about it. It's in the Quran. Who showed joy and performed a good deed on the day of the birth of the Prophet وسلم, and as a big kafir, he receives a little bit of a, tough, uh, a little bit of a lightening, a little bit of relief uh, in Jahannam. A kafir, Imam Musayyuti says, how much more? A muhib, a lover of the Prophet wasallam. If a lover, a beloved one of the Prophet wasallam, shows some. Uh, joy and performs good deeds on the occasion of the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
how much more will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward that person? In the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim, and a Mustadrak is an abridgment of another larger book of hadith. So in theory, only the sound narrations called the Mustadrak. We are told that the Prophet sallallahu when he entered into Medina to Munawwara, he performed a second aqiqah. Right? Two animals were slaughtered. Imam Suyuti says in his fatawa, he did this on his birthday in Medina to Munawwara to celebrate his own birthday. This is in the hadith. So what did they do? What did the Sahaba do? Were they fasting on this day? No. They were sharing food and they were listening to his words. This is what we're doing. This is sunnah. They were gathered together, listening to his speech, eulogizing him, taking wisdom from him, praising him, you know, obeying him, and sharing some food. So, the mawlid is a commemoration. Hajj is a commemoration. Hajj, a commemoration. Ibrahim alayhi Ismail alayhi salam, Adam and Eve. Uh, the five daily prayers is a commemoration. Each prayer has something to do with a specific prophet. The mawlid is a commemoration of the birth of our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam who is the best of creation. Right? So this is a sunnah. Many of the ulama say the mawlid is a sunnah. Right? So, you know, people don't want to celebrate. You don't have to celebrate, but I feel bad for you because you're missing something great. I'm missing something great. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the believers many times in the Quran. Uh, 195 times you'll find the word mu'min uh, in the singular, the dual, the plural, in different case endings, marfu' and mansub and makhfud, mu'min, mu'minun, mu'minin. Describes them in many ayat. But aflah al-mu'minun, for example. The believers will gain salvation. In Surah Al-Ahzab, ayat number six, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, An-Nabiyu awla bil mu'minin min anfusihim. An-Nabiyu awla bil mu'minin min anfusihim. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his life is more important for the believers than their own lives. The Prophet's life takes precedence for the believers over their own life. This is the state we need to achieve. And I mentioned this the other day. Somewhere in a masjid, I don't remember, yesterday is a blur, somewhere, where I mentioned to one of my teachers that 50% of Christians, they can't name the four Gospels in the New Testament. He said, I guarantee you 50% of Muslims coming out of a masjid cannot name one hadith, cannot quote one hadith. One hadith. Adinu nasiha. That's a hadith. Why? We have a crisis of ilm. We have a crisis of love. La yu'minu ahadukum hatta... You don't have complete faith. It's not complete unless I am more beloved to you than your parents and your children and the whole of humanity. How do we get to this mahabba? This is unconditional love. There's different terms for love in Arabic. Mawadda, right? Which is sort of a a uh, courtesy and uh, a willingness to sacrifice for another person. Mawadda, the word Dawood is related to it. Khulla, Khalil, Khulla, friendship, love, Ishq, you know, passionate love, but something that comes and goes. And then Mawadda, uh, Mahabba, Mahabba, steady, unconditional love. The way to Mahabba is through Ma'rifa, is through intimate knowledge of the Prophet. How do we get knowledge? Dirasa wa ta'allum. We have to study. We have to study. We pray, oh Allah, make the Prophet beloved to me. And we waste our time five hours a day watching television. That's the national average. That's the national average in America. We're in that average. We're American. We're watching five hours of television a day. Two hours of Facebook. Wallahi, last week I deactivated my Facebook account. Inshallah, I'll never go back to it. Never, ever. You know how Facebook started? At Harvard. It was a way that... These frat guys were showing pictures of, of women that they've committed uh, fornication with and were raiding them. That's the origin of Facebook. Is there baraka in this? I didn't see any. Wallahu alam. So this is what we have to understand. 
complete faith in the Prophet وسلم, is not just accepting a rational proposition. Yeah, I accept that he's the Prophet of God. We have to have qabool and idhan. Qabool means submissive, means to accept what he brought, completely accept it. And idhan means to have submissiveness towards him. Submissiveness. By your Lord, they don't have complete faith unless they make you a judge in all affairs. And they have no resistance in their heart against your decisions. And they come to you in total submission. This is in the Quran. We have to develop a relationship with the Prophet Sallallahu A relationship. We have to have tahqiq. We have to have actualization of this hadith. We have to move from just accepting a rational proposition. And shaitan believes there's one God. Shaitan knows there's one God. Iblis, does he not know there's one God? He was in the company of angels. He knows the Prophet Sallallahu is a messenger of God. He knows it. He was tantalizing the Mushrikeen at Badr, telling them, you're good, you're number one, go Quraysh, Ra Ra Quraysh, give me a Q, give me a U, egging them on. And the shaitani goes to the wells of Badr, he sees Malaika descending, and he says, Inni bari'um minkum, I am free from you. Inni ara ma la tarawna, I can see something you can't. Inni akhaf Allah, I fear Allah. And he cuts out on them. Shaitan has accepted the rational proposition that the Prophet is a messenger of God. No qabul, no idhan. That's why he's a kafir. So we have to be careful. We need to work on our relationship with the Prophet. I want to talk about some testimonies of love. As I said, the Sahaba were the greatest generation. And the aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is an articulation of the aqidah that the Sahaba were upon. That's our aqidah. So, Sayyidina Ali, karam Allahu wajha. He said, Kana sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ahabba ilayna min kulli shay'in wa min al-ma'il baridi ala dhamma. Subhanallah, what a statement. Sayyidina Ali, he said, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was more beloved to us than everything even more so than cold water when we're thirsty. You gotta think about this. What does cold water mean for the desert Arab? It is an analogy for life itself. It is life. We loved him more than life. You know, sometimes you might say to your spouse, you are the air I breathe, right? Maybe you don't say that. That means I can't live without you. This is how the Sahaba are speaking about the Prophet Sallallahu what did the Prophet ﷺ say about Sayyidina Ali? يُحِبُّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَيُحِبُّهُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ He loves Allah and His Messenger and is beloved by Allah and His Messenger. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, He said, Ya Rasulullah, I prefer that your uncle Abu Talib become Muslim over Abu Quhafa. Do you understand what this means? Abu Quhafa is his own father. I prefer your uncle, Abu Talib, who raised you to become Muslim and go to Jannah over my own biological father who raised me. I'm his blood. Why? It makes you happy. It'll make you happier. When the Prophet was happy, the Sahaba started laughing. If they see the Prophet crying, they start crying. This is the Sahaba. This is how in tune they were with the Prophet ﷺ, with the ahwal, the states of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is not cut off at the death of the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Hassan al-Shadili, he said, uh, If the Prophet ﷺ was veiled from me, the blink of an eye, I would not even consider myself a Muslim. This is someone who has absorption, someone who's annihilated in the prophetic states, annihilated in the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Umar said, I prefer Al-Abbas to, to become Muslim over Al-Khattab, your uncle over my father. 
Abu Huraira says in Musnad Ahmad, O Messenger of God, whenever I see you, my eyes well up with tears of joy. Whenever Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda, whenever he would just look at the Prophet sallallahu he would begin to weep. Just begin to weep. Because he is the sabab of his hidayah. He is the means of his guidance into Jannah. You know, the Prophet sallallahu is buried in Medina al Munawwara. The Caliph one time, I mentioned this earlier as well. The Caliph, Abu, Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, he was in the Masjid al-Nabawi. And he was arguing, he was saying something to Imam Malik ibn Anas. And Malik ibn Anas, you know, he didn't, he thought jidal was haram, you know, bayn uh, al-awam, and makru if it was between the ulama. But here's a Caliph now raising his voice in the Masjid of the Prophet. Raising it, getting louder and louder and louder. And Imam Malik, he suddenly said, lower your voice. <laughs> and the caliph was shocked. He said, Alladheena yaghudduna aswatukum inda rasulillah, inda rasulillah. Ula'ika alladheena imtahana allahu qulubuhum littaqwa lahum maghfiratun wa ajrun azim. Don't you know what Allah said? Those who lower their voice in the presence of the Prophet pointed to the grave of the Prophet Those are the ones that Allah has tested their hearts for taqwa. For them is forgiveness and a great reward. This is the adab they would have. These are the salaf, right? Incredible love, incredible adab, right? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us like them. When, Anas ibn Mal when uh, Malik ibn Anas, the Imam of Medina to Manawara, when people would come to him, he said, what do you want to study? They say, fiqh. He said, bismillah, sit down. If they said, hadith, he said, hold on. He'd go take a shower, put on white clothes, tie his turban, put some perfume on. We're going to talk about hadith. This is the state of the muhib, the state of the, of the beloved, the lover of the Prophet wasallam. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was in Thawr, in the cave. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he went in first into the cave. And he put his arm down the rock crevices to provoke an attack on him by an animal. He wanted to be attacked because his companion is next to him, the Prophet And then the Prophet was exhausted. Abu Bakr Siddiq is sitting, Indian style as it were, I don't know if that's a political, political correct term, in the lotus position. The Prophet his head is on Abu Bakr's lap and he's sleeping. Some sort of poisonous insect, a scorpion or something, begins to lash the toe of Abu Bakr Siddiq. And he's wincing in pain, and the pain was so great that he begins to cry, and one teardrop falls on the blessed cheek of the Prophet Sallallahu and he wakes up, and he said, what happened? And he said, this animal <laughs> stung my toe. He said, why didn't you wake me up? He said, I don't want to disturb your sleep. How can I disturb your sleep? And the Prophet Sallallahu takes some blessed saliva, and he just heals the toe of Abu Bakr Siddiq. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari is buried in Turkey. The Prophet ﷺ entered into Medina to Munawwara. Abu Ayyub had a two-story house. And he told the Prophet ﷺ, take the ground floor, it's easier for you. You're going to have visitors. So Abu Ayyub and his wife were on the second floor. Suddenly it occurred to Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, we're walking above his head. This is what's occurring to the mind of a Sahabi. We're walking over his head. So he goes down and said, Ya Rasulullah, let's switch places. And the Prophet said, no, 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 don't worry about it. It's okay. A lot of people are going to come visiting me. So Abu Ayyub, he looked into the room of the Prophet Wasallam, and he saw the firash, the mat of the Prophet in a certain corner. So he goes back upstairs and he says to his wife, we can never walk in this corner. And they would shimmy across the walls. Because if you stomp your feet in a mud brick home, dust will fall. A glass of water broke. Abu Ayyub ripped his shirt off and began to absorb the water because it might seep down upon the Prophet ﷺ. This is the type of love we're talking about. When they brought him food, when they, when they brought the Prophet ﷺ food and you eat some, Abu Ayyub and his wife would try to determine which part of the plate did the Prophet's finger enter the food. Let's enter from there. For tabarruk, these are sahaba. This is aqidah. This is their aqidah. And one time the Prophet didn't even touch the plate. And Abu Ayyub started crying. Did I offend you? What did I do? Did I offend you? And the Prophet said, I smell some garlic or onions. I have mystical conversations with malaika. I don't eat garlic and onions. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari said, no more garlic and onions in my house ever again. 
This is the state of Sahaba. Imam Ahmad mentions many, many years after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, a few decades later, during the time of Marwan ibn al-Hakam, the governor of Medina, who would become an Umayyad caliph, Marwan was walking in the roda of the Prophet ﷺ. And he saw a man lying on top of the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. And he was crying. There used to be a stone marking the grave. And so Marwan, he walks up and he kicks him. And he says, Atadrima tasna. What do you think you're doing? What do you think you're doing? And the man looked up and said, Ji'tu Rasulallah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ana ji'tu Rasulallah. Ana ji'tu Rasulallah. Wa ma ji'tu al-hajar. Relax. I've, I've come to visit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I haven't come to visit a stone. Who is this man? Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. A companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the love of Sahaba. People say, don't overpraise him. Overpraise the Prophet? Is it possible? Overpraise. His name is written on the Arsh. His name is Kutba ala al Arsh. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. The awraq of Jannah, the leaves of Jannah, have the name of the Prophet. The abwabul Jannah, the gates of Jannah, have the name of the Prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the Prophet. What is our praise? What is our praise? قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُ Go, Say, for the sake of Allah's grace and mercy, for the sake of that, let them show joy. For the sake of Allah's rahma, let them show joy. What is Allah's rahma? Who is Allah's rahma? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We show joy at the coming of the Prophet ﷺ, and it's offensive to people. I don't get it. I don't get it at all. Hmm. Hassan ibn Thabit, you know, before Islam, he, would, he was a great poet amongst the Arabs. And uh, some of the mushrikeen in Medina, they later became munafiqeen after Badr. But there was mushrikeen in Medina, in Yathrib at the time, before it was Medina. They go to Hassan ibn Thabit and they say, write a hijab, a defamatory poem. Write something, defame him, denigrate him, lampoon him. Right? The Prophet ﷺ. Because the poet, had, the sha'ir had power. The sha'ir, if he lampooned you in a poem, it would stay generations in your family, potentially. And if he praised you, it would stay generations. So Hassan, so they gave him some money, a small sum of money. And Hassan ibn Thabit, he waited by a small hill. And the Prophet ﷺ walks by. And Hassan takes one glance at the Prophet ﷺ, and he goes back to his friends and he says, Hadha malukum, laysa li fihi haja. Here's your money, I don't need it. He said, what happened? Did you write something? He said, oh, I wrote something. He said, read it. He said, Lamma ra'aytu anwarahu sata'at, wada'atu min khifati kaffi ala basari. خَوْفًا عَلَىٰ بَصَرِي مِنْ حُسْنِ سُورَتِهِ فَلَسْتُ أَنْذُرُهُ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ قَدْرِي وَرُوحٌ مِّنَ النُّورِ فِي جِسْمٍ مِّنَ الْقَمَرِ كَحِلْيَةٍ نُسِجَتْ مِنَ الْأَنْجُمِ الزُّهْرِ He said, when I saw his lights approaching, lights, anwar, were approaching me. He said, I had to cover my eyes with the palm of my hand out of fear for going blind. Because of his incredible beauty, I could scarcely look at him. A soul from light, from a body carved out of the moon, like a beautiful mantle stitched together with brilliant stars. Muhammadun Basharun, Walaysa Kal Bashari, Wahua Yaqudatun, Wanasu Kal Hajari. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a human being. But he's not like other human beings. He's like a jewel or a ruby, while everyone else are stones. It's the same genus. A, a diamond or a ruby is still a stone, but it's a very special stone. This is what he said. وَأَجْبَلُ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَرَقَدْتُ عَيْنٌ وَأَطْيَبُ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَلِدِ النِّسَاءُ more beautiful than you, no eye has never seen. 
more pure than you, no woman has ever given birth to. You were created faultless. You were created free from every fault, as if, uh, as if you were created according to your own specifications. Imagine if you were, <laughs> if, imagine if you can pick your own physical qualities and, and, uh, and uh, um, internal qualities. What would you choose for yourself? Hassan ibn Thabit said, it's as if you chose your own qualities. His khalq and khuluq were absolutely beautiful. That's why we have to learn the prophetic ad'iya. When he looked in the mirror, what did he say? Allahumma hassan, uh, Allahumma kama hassanta khalqi fa hassan khuluqi. Oh Allah, just as you have made my outward form beautiful, beautify my inward form. You know, one time a brother said, well, I can't make that dua. I don't think I'm a very good looking person. No, you're good looking, mashallah. Don't be so self-deprecating. You're, if you're the son or daughter of Adam, mashallah, you're fi ahsani taqweem. Rabi'a ibn Ka'b al-Aslami. When, this is from Sahih Muslim, Musnad Ahmad. When the ayah was revealed, Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas, and Allah will protect you from the harm of human beings. Right? When this ayah was revealed, the Prophet ﷺ was on a military expedition at the time. He comes out of his tent and he dismisses all of his harras, all of his bodyguards. He says, you're free to go. My Lord is now protecting me. So everyone leaves except one man. Rabi'a ibn Ka'b al-Aslami, radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda. And the Prophet said to him, I dismissed all of them. You're free to go. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm not here for hirasa. I'm here for khidmah. I'm here for service. Give me something to do. La bayk, Ya Rasulullah. I'm at your service. La bayk. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Get me a bowl of water for, for, for wudu. One bowl of water. So here you go, Rasulullah. Give him a bowl of water. The Prophet looked at him and said, Sal, Sal. Ask me for something now. Subhanallah. Bowl of water. What are you going to ask for? The Sahaba, mashallah, they have high spiritual himma. Very high spiritual ambition. Right? We have high spirit, we have high dunya we ambition. We should have high spiritual ambition. Right? What did he say? Oh, you know, can I have, you know, a few camels and a few goats make me the governor of this or that district? What did he say? Rabbi ibn Ka'b. He said, Ya Rasulullah, as'aluka murafaqataka fil jannah. O Messenger of God, I ask you for your companionship in paradise. This is what I want. And the Prophet وسلم, he smiled and he said, Awa ghayra dhalik, anything else? He said, Huwa dhaka, that's it. That's all I want. Fa'inni ala nafsika bi kathratis sujood. Help me do this for you. Literally, help me overcome your nafs by making sajda in abundance. So the ulama say, if you want to be the companion, if you want the suhbah of the Prophet وسلم, in Jannah, based on this hadith, we have to establish the prayer. Number one, it is the essence of our spirituality. The celestial name of the Prophet وسلم, is given in the Quran. It was quoted by Isa السلام, is Ahmad. That's his name in the celestial realm. Ahmad is Alif, like Qiyam, Alif, you're standing. And then Ha, Ruqur, Mim, Sujood, Dal, Qa'ada. The name is a, a, a raka of worship. He is the perfect slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He perfected Ibadah and Ubudiyah. He perfected Ibadah, worship of God, and Ubudiyah, attitude with God, slavehood. At Ta'if, he was stoned out of the city. Mushrikeen are uh, uh, having pity on him. A bunch of thugs and children were stoning him for three miles outside of Ta'if. They were following him for three miles, throwing stones at him, aiming for his feet. The traditions say they wanted to cripple him so he'd fall and kill him. This is what they were trying to do. It was an assassination attempt. He barely got away. He collapses under a tree. He makes a beautiful dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says in the dua, if this is happening to me, and you're not angry with me, فَلَا أُبَالِي Then I don't mind. I don't mind. If they're going to kill me, torture me, but you're not angry with me, then I don't mind. This was his concern. Sallallahu alayhi wa la alihi wa sallam. They say a wali of God, he doesn't complain. If he's in the shade, he doesn't seek the sun. If he's standing in the sun, he doesn't seek the shade. He's content where Allah puts him.
Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. Praise be to Allah in every state. Because the, the wali of God, he understands the, the big picture, the great picture. Ali al-Ridha, he came to Nishapur. Imam Ali al-Ridha. And he said, and the people of Nishapur, 20,000 people came out. And they said to him, Hadithna hadithan min abaik. Give us a tradition from your forefathers. He said, I heard from my father, Musa al-Kadhim, who heard from his father, Jafar al-Sadiq, who heard from his father, Muhammad al-Baqir, who heard from his father, Ali ibn Hussein Zainul al -Abidin, who heard from his father, Hussein ibn Ali, who heard from his father, Ali ibn Abi Talib, who heard from his father-in-law, Al-Habib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who heard from Jibreel alayhi salam, who heard from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this golden chain, who heard from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who said, La ilaha illallah husni, فَمَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ دَخَلَ حُسْنِي وَمَنْ دَخَلَ حُسْنِي أَمِنَ مِنْ عَذَابِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ is my fortress. Whoever says لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ has entered my fortress. And whoever enters my fortress, he is safe from my punishment. This is what the awliya know. Big picture idea. Ultimately, they're under the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These little new nuisances in the dunya. That's the nature of the dunya. Right? So this is, this is what Sahaba were thinking about. Khubayb right? ibn Adi. Sayyidina Khubayb, he was captured after Ghazwat Badr by Mushrikeen, the, the Mushrikeen of Mecca. He was captured, put in prison until the sacred months were over, then taken out to a place called Tan'im, where they basically crucified him. They killed him, they executed him. <clears throat> and they said to him, do you have a last request? And he said, yeah, I'd like to pray raka'atain. So he began to pray. In the middle of his prayer, they turned him from the Kaaba to insult him. After his prayer, he said, fa'inama tuwallu fathamma wajhullah. Whichever way you turn, you'll find the countenance of God. So they nailed him to a stake. And they began to deride him, make fun of him. And uh, one of the leaders of the Mushrikeen, he said, don't you wish you can trade places with Muhammad right now? You were home with your family, and he was here. And Sayyidina Khubayb, he said, I don't wish a shawka, a thorn, to prick the finger of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I don't wish a thorn to prick his finger. This is what the Sahaba were thinking about. And when the reeh of Jannah filled his lungs, and the ru'ya of Jannah filled his eyes, what came into his mind? He's about to pass away. What came into his mind? He said, Ya Allah, balligh salami. Balligh salami. Oh Allah, convey my salam to your Rasul. He was thinking about the Prophet Wasallam in Medina. Paradise did not distract him from the Prophet Wasallam. So the Prophet ﷺ was in Medina to al-Munawwara. He was sitting with Zayd ibn Haritha and other Sahaba. And suddenly he, a feeling came over him as if the revelation was descending. He raises his head وسلم, and he says, Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah ya khubayb. He so said, what happened? Your companion is being martyred in Mecca. And Abu Sufyan ibn Harb at this time was not Muslim. He was there and he said, Ma ra'aytu ahadan yuhibbu ahadan kahubbi ashabi Muhammadin Muhammadan. I've never seen anyone love anyone like the companions of Muhammad love Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. It's like when Urwa ibn Mas'ud from the Quraysh came. He was the negotiator for the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So he spent some time with the Sahaba and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in their camp. And he went back to the Quraysh and he said, Wallahi, I visited Caesar and Kisra, and the Najashi. Wallahi, I've never seen anyone respect, give ta'zeem to anyone else like the companions of Muhammad give ta'zeem to the Prophet He said they were jostling over his wadu, you know, ma'al musta'mal, his used wudu water. They, they were trying to catch his water, rub it on their faces. When he was getting his hair cut, no hair, not a strand of hair, struck, struck the earth. They were picking up the, before it would even, Strike the earth or taking his hair. This is the love of Sahaba. This is the love of Sahaba. Khalid ibn Walid, you know, he had some hair of the Prophet in his helmet. And he was in the battle. 
And then he called a temporary retreat, because there's kar and far, right? Temporary retreat to regroup. And so all of his men left. He was the last one out of the foray. He was always the last man out. First in, last out, right? And they looked at him, and his helmet was missing. He's riding his horse. And they said to him, your helmet, and he started going like this. Immediately, he turns around into the enemies, into the foray. He has no protection. He's alone. So where are you going? He comes back a short time later. He's wearing his helmet. So I'm not going to leave my helmet for these mushrikeen to trample upon. This has the blessed sha'ar of the Prophet ﷺ. This is what Sahaba are thinking about. You know, this hadith in Bukhari, it was paraphrased earlier that the Prophet ﷺ is giving khutbah and the Bedouin comes in. And the Sahaba always had mixed feelings about the Bedouin. Because they, they, they loved the questions the Bedouin would ask. But they didn't like how the Bedouin were rough around the edges. They lacked adab a little bit. Right? So the Bedouin comes in and in the middle of the khutbah, he says, Ya Rasulullah, mata sa'a. And the Prophet says something, he motions, you know, sit down, let me finish the khutbah. So he finishes the khutbah. And then after he gives the salams, he turns around and says, Man is sa'il? Where is the one who asked about the sa'a? He says, Anna Ya Rasulullah. He says, Wa madha adadta laha? What did you prepare for the sa'a, the hour? He said, la shay'a, not much. You know, I do the minimum. Not a lot of extra prayer and fasting. But I do the fara'id. Illa anni uhibbullah wa rasulah. But I love Allah and his messenger. You know, Anas ibn Malik, he said, we were so annoyed at this Bedouin for <laughs> interrupting the khutbah. We were so annoyed. But then the Prophet said, Al mar'u ma'aman ahab. A person will be, will be with the one whom he loves. And Anna said, Thank God for the Bedouin. We were never happier than with this statement. SubhanAllah. You know, Hadith Qudsi in Bukhari. You know, my servant does not draw close unto me with anything more beloved than his fara'id. We know the hadith, right? He continues to draw close unto me with his extra credit worship, nawafil, hatta uhibba, until I love him. And then I, I become the eye by which he sees, the hand by which he walks, and the foot by which he, the hand by which he grabs, and the foot by which he walks. And if you were to ask anything from me, I shall surely give it to him. This is Sahih Bukhari. Right? So nawafil, the five pillars have nawafil. For prayer, you do extra prayers. Right? For zakah, you give sadaqah. For hajj, you go to umrah. For fasting, you do extra fasting. What about shahada? What is the nafila of shahada? I asked one of my teachers. He said, dhikrullah wa salah ala nabi. So maybe we're too lazy to do extra prayers. We don't want to go to umrah. We don't want to give more than the zakah. We can't be too lazy. We can't be bakhil. Right? As the Prophet wasallam said, the one who hears my name, falam yusalli alayya. This is a miserly person. So, inshallah, we can be beloved by Allah with our extra dhikrullah and our salah ala nabi. And we'll get to more of that in a minute, inshallah. Importance of that. <clears throat> but they sought ittisal. They sought connection with the Prophet ﷺ. In Sahih Bukhari, we're told on the narration of Sahal ibn Sa'd, that a woman of Medina came to the Prophet Sallallahu and gave the Prophet a beautiful white piece of cloth. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, uh, I made this for you. And the Prophet Sallallahu accepted it with graciousness and made dua for her. And then he went into his house and wrapped it around his lower half. He used it as a tunic. And he came and he sat with the Sahaba. And the Sahabi right next to him, who's not named in the Hadith, he started touching the cloth. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, this is jameel, this is beautiful, can I have it? <laughs> can I have this? And he said, Naam, yes, you can have it. You know, Wa amma sa'ila fala tanhar. He never said no. Anna said, he never said la to anyone. He never said la except when he said la ilaha illallah. He goes back into his house, puts on his old tunic. While he was gone, the other sahaba began censuring him, this sahabi. The ma'ahsanta, you have not done well, right? He wore that because he needed it. And you knew if you asked him, he would never say no. You knew he wouldn't say no. And this companion said, Wallahi, ma sa'altahu li albasaha. I didn't ask him for it so that I can wear it. 
إِنَّمَا سَأَلْتَهُ لِتَكُونَ كَفَنِي يَوْمَ أَمُوتُ I asked him for it so it would be my death shroud in my grave on the day I die because it touched the skin of the Prophet ﷺ. And then the narrator of the hadith, he says, فَكَانَتْ كَفَنَا Indeed, it was his death shroud. <laughs> SubhanAllah. In Muslim and Abu Dawood, we're told that Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, she had the burda, the mantle of the Prophet ﷺ. The burda that our mother Aisha was clutching when she was passing away. The wife of the Prophet, no one had more intimate contact with the Prophet ﷺ. Yet when she's passing away, she's clutching to the burda of the Prophet ﷺ. And then it came into the possession of Asma. And she said sick people would come to her. It's mentioned in the hadith. And she would fill up cups of water and just dip the edge of the burda. Dip the edge of the burda into the water like this. It's here. Bismillah. Drink this. They drink it. Shifa. Kamila. <clears throat> and Ibn Hisham mentions, it's ittisal. They want, they want connection with the Prophet Right. Every relationship is cut off Yawm Al-Qiyamah Except those who are connected to me Either through Ahl Al-Bayt or other means Through love, through Ittiba' Salmanu minna Ahl Al-Bayt Right? An honorary member of Ahl Al-Bayt Then one of my favorite hadith Because I'm Persian Salmanu minna Ahl Al-Bayt Right? SubhanAllah This is what they want At Ghazwat Badr The Prophet ﷺ was lining up the Mujahideen who was the man in the front row, Sawad ibn Ghaziyah al-Ansari, who was a little bit ahead of everybody else in the front row. And, you know, you have to have discipline. You need to line up straight like we do in prayer. So the Prophet sallallahu he's walking down the saf, and he's holding uh, uh, some arrows, and he just barely taps Sawad on the chest. It barely taps him. Like, get back a little bit. And then Sawad says, you hurt me, O messenger of God. You hurt me. And the Sahaba, there was sort of a murmur, what? You hurt me, and Allah sent you in, with truth and justice. So give me my requital. Give me my vengeance. The Prophet ﷺ gave him the arrows, exposed his chest, and said, why don't you take it? And Sawad lunged forward and planted a kiss over the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, why the ruse? Why did you do this? And he said, I feel like I'm going to be martyred today. I wanted the last thing, my lips to touch, to be your blessed skin. This is what he said. This is the love of Sahaba. This is the love of Sahaba. Umm Sulaim, the mother of Anas, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet wasallam. sometimes he would take a qalula, a nap, in her residence. It's very hot, he would sweat. He woke up, she's collecting his sweat in a bottle. He said, what, what are you doing? He says, this is the best smelling fragrance I've ever smelt in my life. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Thawban. There's a companion named Thawban. Very, mashallah, very sincere companion who fell ill. He was very sick. The Prophet ﷺ visited him. He was yellow. He was emaciated. And he said, I haven't uh, eaten anything. I haven't slept I haven't drink and drunk anything in days. So the Prophet said, what's wrong with you? And he said, I just, I can't get this thought out of my head. So what's that thought? And he said, Hal araka fil jannah? This was his thought. Hal araka fil jannah? Aw la arak. Please tell me, will I see you in paradise or not? Because you're Habib Allah, and you're going to be in the greatest of the highest of stations. And inshallah, I just might barely get in. So I'm not going to see you in Jannah. This was causing a Sahabi to lose sleep. This was causing a Sahabi to, to stop eating. Right? The ayah was revealed. This is the sabab al-nuzul of the ayah, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يُتِعِ اللَّهُ رَسُولًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا Whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, they are going to be with those who have the blessing of Allah upon them from the prophets, from the truthful ones, from the martyr witnesses, and from the righteous one. What an excellent fellowship. What an excellent fellowship. Sayyidina Bilal ibn Rabah. 
Sayyidina Bilal, <coughs> the Prophet Sallallahu saved Sayyidina Bilal in every way you can imagine. Sayyidina Bilal was a slave who was being tortured in the desert. And the message of the Prophet Sallallahu took him from that low level to on top of the Kaaba, making Adhan. He would stand in front of the Prophet Sallallahu when the Prophet was sitting on his minbar. He was standing right in front of him, calling the Adhan, saying, Muhammad Rasulullah, three feet from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Bilal loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with a love that we cannot possibly imagine. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed into the mercy of his Lord, Sayyidina Bilal could not even live in Medina to Munawrah. He had to leave the city because everything reminded him of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, called separation anxiety. It's like when a child dies, right? Sometimes the parents, they have to, they have to move houses because they go into that room and they, can't, they just start weeping. This was the entire city of Medina for Sayyidina Bilal. He goes to Dimashq, Damascus. You know, people die from this. People have died from extreme shawq, longing for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're called Shuhada'ul Muhabba, the martyrs of love. Fatima al Zahra. The ulama say, Qutilat bi sayf al hub wa shawq. Killed by the sword of love and longing. Subhanallah. Abu Bakr al Siddiq, every time he would speak after the passing of the Prophet, they would smell like burning liver coming from his breath. They asked, What's wrong with you? My, my liver is on fire. Why? Shawqan li Rasulillah, out of longing for the Prophet. This is what, this is what ultimately killed him. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda. Shuhada'ul muhabba wa shawq. These are Sahaba. So Sayyidina Bilal, he felt death coming. He leaves Medina. He goes to Dimashq. He's living there. Never gave adhan in Dimashq. He sees a dream. If you see the Prophet in a dream, it's actually him. This hadith is mutawatir. Man ra'ani fil manami faqad ra'ani. Fa inna shaytana la yatamathalu bi. Man ra'ani fil manami faqad ra'al haqq. If you see me in a dream, it's me. Shaitan cannot imitate me. If you see me in a dream, you've seen the truth. The Prophet ﷺ comes to him in a dream. Ya Bilal. What is this aversion in distance, O Bilal? Isn't it about time to visit me in Medina? You know, Sayyidina Uthman also, the day he was martyred. Sayyidina Uthman was reading his mushaf. He, he dismissed his bodyguards. Who were his bodyguards? The, the men at the door, Al Hassanain, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein. He said, You're free to go. I will not, you know, shed blood in Medina. People coming raided his house. He tied his izar so that when he struck, his aura wouldn't be exposed. He's reading the Quran. Right? He kind of fell asleep, dozed off. Who comes to his dream? The Prophet ﷺ, with a company of Sahaba that were martyred behind him. And Sayyidina Uthman was fasting that day. And the Prophet said to him, isn't it, don't, don't you want to break your fast with us? Don't you want to break your fast with us? <laughs> and then he wakes up and he's struck and he's martyred. Subhanallah. So Sayyidina Bilal, he goes towards Medina. As soon as he comes into Medina, the lava tracks, immediately his knees give out. He can barely walk. He's weeping profusely. He walks into the Masjid al Nabawi. He falls down on the grave of the Prophet ﷺ, and he's rolling around in the dust. This is because he entered into a hal, right? It's excusable. So, you know, when we go to visit a graveyard, there's a certain adab, right? But when one goes into a hal out of mahabba, it's excused. This is a sahabi. He's rolling around on the grave of the Prophet. ﷺ. Abu Bakr al Siddiq comes to him and says, Give us an adhan. Give us one adhan, right? Adhin lana kama kunta tu adhin. Give us an adhan like you used to give adhan. He said, Wallahi, I can't do it. So Sayyidina Umar comes in. Says, Abu Bakr told Umar, he said, look, Bilal is here. Adhin lana. Adhin lana. He said, I can't do it. I can't do it. And Hassan and Hussein, they come in. And Bilal, Bilal hasn't seen them for over a year. And children go, grow very quickly. And Imam Hassan looks like the Prophet ﷺ from the neck up. He looks exactly like the Prophet ﷺ. Imam Hussein from the neck down looks like the Prophet ﷺ. 
سيا بلال أدل لنا كما كنت تؤذن لأجل جدنا make an adhan for the sake of our grandfather give us one adhan he can't say no he starts making adhan Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar people start coming into the streets of Medina هذا صوت بلال this is the voice of Bilal بعيث رسول الله the messenger has been resurrected, some of them said. The messenger has been resurrected. Be of good cheer. Old women that haven't left their house in years were coming streaming into the masjid. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashadu anna Muhammadan. And he falls down. He said the name of his beloved and his knees give out. His voice gives out. He falls down in a swoon. They had to pick him up, take him out of the masjid. This is Sayyidina Bilal. This is the love of Sahaba. This is the next time he gave Adhan. This is the love of Sahaba. Nusaybah bintu Ka'ab, also known as Umu Umara, stood in front of a, a horse, an, an armed horseman at Ghazwat Uhud, Abdullah ibn Qami'ah, who had just killed Mus'ab ibn Umar. And now, he sees the Prophet ﷺ, he charges with his horse, a female companion, Nusayba bintu Ka'b, Umu Umara, stands in front of this horse with her sword, not going to budge. So Ibn Qami'ah, he starts striking her on the shoulder, breaks her clavicle. She, she, it took her a year to recover from that. The Prophet ﷺ said, wherever I looked on the day of Uhud, I saw Umu Umara, defending me and her two sons. Allahumma ij'alhum, Allahumma ij'alhum rufaqai fil jannah. Sahaba are hearing this dua from the Prophet Oh Allah, make them my companions in paradise. Right? SubhanAllah. In the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim, a woman uh, lost her father, her husband, and her brother at Uhud. And she was hysterical. They calmed down, totally hysterical. So relax, what's wrong with you? I want to see the Prophet I want to see him. They don't know what she's going to do. See him, is she angry with him? She sees him at a distance and she immediately calms down. She said, my concern was for the Prophet I heard a rumor he had been killed on the day of Uhud. Kullu khutbin ba'daka jalal ya Rasulullah. Every calamity is only important after you, O Messenger of God. And then we look at the, the people of Ghazwat Uhud, the Sahaba. The Prophet ﷺ, he named 10 men in a hadith that is tawatir, ashran mubashirina bil jannah. If you look at these 10 men, the majority of them defended the Prophet ﷺ with life and limb at Ghazwat Uhud. They, they proved without a shadow of doubt, an nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. Talha ibn Ubaidullah. 70 wounds he suffered at the, on the day of Uhud. The Prophet said, a walking martyr. When Ibn Qami'ah swung his sword, aiming for the head of the Prophet ﷺ, Talha ibn Ubaidullah, he put his bare hand up to, to block the blow. He was able to turn the blade over and it landed flush on the face of the Prophet ﷺ. Talha lost the use of his right hand for the rest of his life. After the battle, the Prophet ﷺ was ailing from his injuries. They were climbing Mount Uhud and Talha got down on the ground and said, just step on my back. And he get up, he, he, he used himself as a, as a human stool for the Prophet to stand on top of him and climb up on Jabal Uhud with, with his hand completely dysfunctional. As Zubair ibn Awam, defending the Prophet ﷺ. Many years later, a Zubair took off his shirt and one of his sons said, oh my God, what happened to you? Scar tissue everywhere. He said, Ghazwat Uhud, fi difa'i Rasulillah. In the defense of the Prophet ﷺ. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas was 15 years old when he became Muslim in Mecca. His mother took an oath. She said, I will not eat anything or comb my hair unless you renounce Islam. Two weeks went by. She had not eaten anything. And Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, he goes to his mother and he says, if you had a thousand souls and died a thousand, died a thousand times, I'm never going to renounce Islam. She immediately started eating. So, oh, are you serious? Okay. 
Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, on the day of Uhud, was standing right in front of the Prophet a few feet away from archers firing arrows at the Prophet and he'd put his bare hand up in front of the Prophet to block arrows, and then he'd take arrows and shoot. And the Prophet ﷺ once in a while would collect some arrows and give them to Sa'd and say, Irmi ya Sa'd, fidaka abi wa ummi, fidaka abi wa ummi. Sayyidina Ali heard this, he started shaking. But what did he say? Shoot your arrows, O Sa'd. May my parents be ransom for you. He never said this to anybody else. Why? Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas was standing right in front of enemy fire. Sayyidina Ali, they say, is like a, a moth around a flame doing circles around the Prophet Sallallahu deflecting swords and bows and arrows. You know, these are Sahaba. And the chain mail of the Prophet had penetrated his cheek, right? And they couldn't pull it out because he would grimace in pain. So Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, he used his teeth, pulled out the, the rings, the chain mail, and lost his two front teeth in the process. He didn't care, right? Sayyidina Umar, Imam Tabari mentions, I'll end with this. Sayyidina Umar, these are testimonies of love. You know, because people say, you should be Salafi. Okay, these are the Salaf. Let's be Salafi. These are the Salaf. These are Sahaba. Right? So Sayyidina Umar, Imam Tabari mentions in his Tariq, Imam Ghazali mentions also in Kitab Dhikr al Maut. Sayyidina Umar was standing in the mihrab of the Prophet. When he was martyred, he was standing, his feet were in the place where the Prophet would stand for prayer. And this, I'm sorry to say a Persian, Abu Lu'lu'a al-Majusi. He stabbed Sayyidina Umar several times under the navel and a few men in the front row as well. And Sayyidina Umar, he's falling down. He grabs the first man he sees behind him, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. He said, lead the prayer. And he falls down. The people in the back have no idea what's happening. He said, we heard the takbir of Umar, but the qara'ah of Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. Some of the Sahaba broke their prayer. They threw a blanket over Abu Lu'lu'a, who took his own life under the blanket. So Sayyidina Umar, he said, was he a Muslim? And they said, no, he was Majusi. He said, Alhamdulillah. He said, what do you want, O Amir al muminin He said, go to our mother Aisha and ask her for a special favor. He told his son, Abdullah ibn Umar, Ask him a special favor. Ask her for a special favor. What, what do you want? Ask her for that. The greatest real estate in the universe, Mujma Alay, the most holiest place in creation, is the roda of the Prophet. ﷺ. The soil underneath the blessed body of the Prophet ﷺ is the holiest, the most muqaddas place in creation, Mujma Alay, by consensus. So Abdullah ibn Umar goes to our mother Aisha and says, oh, Amir al Mu'minin Umar is asking for this spot next to the Prophet. And Aisha, she has ethar, she's selfless. She says, Yes, of course. And he says, Oh, he goes back to Sayyidina Umar. And Sayyidina Umar, he says, He says, Alhamdulillah, lam yakun shay'un fi nafsi aham min dalik. Nothing in this universe was more important to me than that. Nothing in this universe, there's nothing at all which is more important for me, to me than that. But then he said to his son, Abdullah, he said, when, I'm, when I pass away, ask her again. Maybe she said that out of deference for me. And don't say, Amir al-Mu'mineen. Say, my father Umar. So Sayyidina Umar passes away. Abdullah ibn Umar goes back to our mother Aisha and says, my father Umar is asking for it. She said, yeah, I already said yes. Right? So our mother Aisha said, when the Prophet ﷺ was buried in her apartment, uh, he, she used to visit him without a hijab. That's her husband. And Abu Bakr was buried there. That's her father. She didn't wear a hijab. She said, now when Umar is there, I have to wear a hijab. <laughs> SubhanAllah. So here's my ending. Uh, I want people to say, inshallah, when I say these points, inshallah. Let's make uh, an agreement. That we're going to do our five daily prayers on time, inshallah, every day, and also 100 salawats upon the Prophet, every day. This will take you five minutes. 
Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. That's the minimum. How many words? Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Get a subha. Everyone used to have a subha in the Muslim world, right? Tasbih, you know, or get a clicker, do something. Do 100 salawat. It takes you five minutes. You can do it while you're driving, while you're at work, you know, between meals. 100 salawat, inshallah. Say inshallah. Read 15 minutes a day the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. There's a beautiful uh, seerah in English, in whatever language you understand. If it's English, Martin Ling's is seerah. Martin Ling's called Muhammad, his life based on the earliest sources, which is taken primarily from a seerah an Nabawiyah by Ibn Hisham. It's a beautiful seerah. And then when you finish with that, study the shama'il of the Prophet ﷺ. I was so pleased to see that in the masjid of Imam uh, Didmar, they're, they're, they're teaching uh, Yusuf al Nabahani's text, Wasail al Wasul ila Shama'il al Rasul, been translated into English. Right? The means of arrival at the Shama'il of the Prophet by Yusuf al Nabahani. So get this book. It's a beautiful book. It's been translated beautifully. So read the Shama'il. And then go to Khasa'is. So Sirah, Shama'il, and then Khasa'is. The uh, book that's been translated recently is Bidayat uh, al-Sul fi Tafdil al-Rasul. The beginning of inquiry into the eminence of the Prophet Sallallahu Imam Izzuddin Ibn Abdus Salam. It's been translated. Bidayat al-Sul, the beginning of inquiry. Read 15 minutes, start with the Sirah. When you're finished, go to the Shama'il. And then when you're done, go to the Khasa'is and then go back to the Sirah. So you're constantly learning about the Prophet Sallallahu This is how we, this is how we're going to love him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Inshallah. I'll finish with this. One time a Christian said to me, why do you revere the Prophet ﷺ so much and he's passed away, but Jesus is alive? Right? First of all, there's a hadith in Musnad, Abu Ya'la, Al-Anbiya'u Ahya'un Fi quburihim yusallun All of the Prophets are alive in their graves. It's actually a heightened state of life. They have heightened senses. It's a greater type of life. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Abu Dawood, مَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ يُسَلِّمُ عَلَيَّ إِلَّا رَدَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيَّ رُوحِي حَتَّى أَرُدَّ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ No one greets me except that Allah returns my soul to me so that I might, re I might reply to his salam. This is what he said. مَنْ صَلَّ عَلَيَّ in the qabri sami'tu. If you greet me at my grave, I'll hear it. Woman salla alayya na'iyan bulikhtuhu. And if you greet me from a distance, it will be conveyed to me by an angel. The most important thing is, huwa hayyun fi qulubina. He is alive in our hearts. He is alive in our hearts. Which prophet has the extensive biography? Who, which prophet has more, more of a legacy left behind than the Prophet ﷺ? We know everything about him ﷺ. The way they used to dress, how many white hairs were on his temple, what his nose looked like, how he tied his turban, what was his attitude with his enemies, with his wife, with his companions. Which prophet is like this? He is alive in our hearts. He is alive in our hearts because he actualized real unconditional love for him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillahi wa rabbil alamin. Wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.